Part three, the macronutrients. Now that we know what happens to food when we eat it, let's look closer at each of those energy producing nutrients, the macronutrients. Remember from our sentence, could Fanny play violin much worse, that the three macronutrients are carbohydrates, fats, and protein. Section A, carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are the major energy source for your diet. Foods with high carbohydrate value are starches, sugars, cellulose, and gums made and stored in plants. Did you say carbohydrates are found in cellulite? No. Carbohydrates are found in some cellulose products, not cellulite. Cellulose is a dietary fiber that comes from the framework of plants. Examples of cellulose sources are the stems and leaves of vegetables like cabbages, seed and grain coverings like bran, whole wheat and whole rye products, and also apples and pears. There are two categories for carbohydrates, simple and complex. Simple carbohydrates are sugars, and the complex carbohydrates are starches and fibers. Simple carbohydrates are foods like fruits and honey. Simple carbos taste sweet. Some simple carbohydrates, like fruits, are really good for you, while others, like candy corn, are not. Complex carbohydrates are foods like potatoes, peas, and beans. All right, like we said, simple carbos taste sweet. Why? Well, because they contain sugar. Sugars, which are simple carbohydrates, are either called monosaccharides, mono meaning one, or disaccharides, di meaning two. Monosaccharides are simple sugars made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. There are six carbons in monosaccharides, and for that reason, they are called hexoses. Just like a hexagon has six sides, a hexose has six carbons. Monosaccharides are the most important sugars in nutrition because all other sugar combinations are built from them. We'll look at these different sugar combinations in just a second. There are three main monosaccharides, glucose, fructose, and galactose. They're all made up of variations of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The sweetness of a simple carbohydrate depends on the type of monosaccharide it contains. Though it may sound like the name of a ship in a science fiction movie, galactose is a pretty weak sweetener. So simple carbohydrates made from galactose aren't all that sweet. Glucose is the next sweetest monosaccharide, and fructose is mouth-puckeringly sweet. You may have noticed that all the monosaccharides end in O-S-E, O-S. Remember we said that enzymes end in A-S-E, A's? Well, the monosaccharide name will end in O-S, and the enzyme name that breaks the monosaccharide down will end in A's. For example, galactase breaks down galactose. Glucose, or blood sugar as it's commonly called, is one of the body's main sources of energy. It's the only sugar that feeds the brain. Often, long-distance runners take glucose tablets or consume sports drinks made with glucose to raise their blood sugar level in the hope of getting more energy. For most endurance athletes, it makes sense to use glucose supplements if their exercise routine or competition lasts longer than 90 minutes. But for your average athlete, water is just fine. Water is used for the transportation of nutrients through the body and for the overall maintenance of body temperature. Your body has enough readily available stores of glucose for most sports, so water should sufficiently help regulate the process. Okay, so that was an introduction to monosaccharides, the first type of simple carbohydrate. The other type of simple carbohydrate is a disaccharide. Disaccharides are just pairs of monosaccharides. They're all made up of some combination of glucose and one other monosaccharide. So the disaccharides are all either glucose and glucose, glucose and fructose, or glucose and galactose. The disaccharide made up of glucose and glucose is maltose. This is also known as malt sugar. Lactose, or milk sugar, is made up of glucose and galactose. And sucrose, or table sugar, the sugar that you put on your cornflakes in the morning, is made up of glucose and fructose. Now on to the next type of carbohydrate, complex carbohydrates. Complex carbohydrates are called polysaccharides. The prefix poly means many, and polysaccharides are made up of many monosaccharide chains. This is what we meant when we said that monosaccharides are the most important sugars in nutrition. They're the building blocks for all other sugars. There are three important complex carbohydrates in nutrition. Glycogen, starch, and fibers. First of all, glycogen is the form in which the human body stores glucose for much of its energy. 
Glucose is converted to glycogen and stored in that form in the body. Glycogen is stored in the liver and muscles just waiting to release all that energy. Whenever we need energy, the glycogen in our liver and muscles is quickly converted back to glucose, which as we said, is the body's main source of energy. Glycogen is stored in the form that makes it very easily convertible from glycogen to glucose. Glycogen has many places where saccharide units attach so they can be broken off easily and used. Just think of glycogen as the human storage form of glucose. To better understand how this works, let's visualize it. You see, glucose is multi-branched, like this, so it can be broken off for energy at many ends, rather than just at two ends. The next complex carbohydrate is starch. Starches are a form of glucose stored in plants. Good sources of starch are grains such as rice, wheat, and corn, legumes like peas and beans, and tubers such as potatoes and yams. Each starch molecule contains hundreds of glucose molecules. The last complex carbohydrate we'll look at is fiber. Fiber is the structural part of plants that cannot be broken down by human digestive enzymes, even though most are polysaccharides. Unlike most foods, stronger contractions are needed to move fiber through the GI tract. That may sound like a bad thing, but actually it's a good thing. Fiber is either soluble or insoluble. Soluble fiber aids in the lowering of cholesterol, and insoluble fiber helps with regularity. Or more simply put, some fiber, the more soluble ones, break down in digestion, while others, the insolubles, well, they just pass right through you. You know, to keep you regular. Fiber also contributes to the digestion process by stimulating peristalsis. That's right. So, even though plenty of water is still needed, fiber helps relieve constipation. Many scientists believe that fiber reduces the risk of colon cancer, and fiber also appears to lower blood cholesterol levels. Fiber may also be helpful to people interested in weight loss, because high fiber foods increase the feeling of fullness after meals. Excess fiber consumption, however, may interfere with the absorption of some minerals. Why is that? Well, being that fiber aids with regularity, it increases the speed of food through the gastrointestinal tract, or GI tract. When this happens, food is moving too fast for all the nutrients, like minerals, to be absorbed. Intestinal discomfort may occur when fiber consumption is first increased, but the body usually adjusts. Be sure to increase your water intake when dietary fiber is increased, or you'll end up with constipation. Whole grain products, vegetables, fruits, dry peas, beans, lentils, nuts, and seeds are good sources of fiber. Typically, Americans consume only about 11 grams of fiber daily. The current recommendation is for 25 to 35 grams of fiber from a wide variety of sources. So get the word out. One last thing about fiber. When people talk about fiber, they often throw around terms like crude fiber or dietary fiber. The general term fiber has been applied to indigestible carbohydrate and non-carbohydrate substances. But when people talk about the terms crude and dietary, they often use them improperly. So let's not let that happen to you. Listen up. Dietary fiber refers to naturally occurring material in foods, mostly plants, that's not digested. Crude fiber, on the other hand, is what's left over after food's been treated to death in a lab with chemicals with long names. We've just looked at both simple and complex carbohydrates. Why spend so much time on this stuff? Good question. Well, carbohydrates are the most efficient form of energy. Each gram of carbohydrate supplies four kilocalories of energy. In terms of priority, the body transforms carbohydrates into energy first. So your body really likes this carbohydrate stuff. Most experts agree that 55 to 60% of a person's total food energy should come from carbohydrates. Excess carbohydrates in the body are stored in two forms. First, as glycogen for energy, and second, as body fat. Carbohydrates also compose parts of many body substances, such as nervous and connective tissue, hormones, and enzymes. Carbohydrate digestion begins in the mouth. In the saliva in your mouth, there's a salivary enzyme called amylase. This enzyme starts to break down carbohydrates by hydrolyzing them into shorter polysaccharides and maltose. Okay, so what did all that just mean? Well, like we said, to hydrolyze something means to break it down into smaller compounds by joining up with the elements of water to make it easier to digest. We already learned what polysaccharides are. They're monosaccharide chains. And maltose, well, that's just a polysaccharide made up of two glucose units. 
From the mouth, carbohydrates move on down to the stomach, where carbohydrate digestion comes to a halt. No significant carbohydrate digestion takes place in the stomach. The mother load of carbodigestion occurs in the small intestine. Okay, so we've got these somewhat broken down carbohydrates sitting in the small intestine. What happens next? Well, the pancreas produces several different enzymes that are sent to the small intestine by hormones. The enzymes that the pancreas produces are pancreatic amylase, maltase, sucrase, and lactase. Pancreatic amylase breaks down starches, maltase breaks down maltose, sucrase breaks down sucrose, and lactase breaks down lactose. The disaccharides are hydrolyzed down to monosaccharides in the small intestine and are carried through the bloodstream to the liver. The liver then converts the monosaccharides to other compounds, usually glucose. Simple sugars raise blood sugar rapidly because their digestion and absorption is quick and easy. That's why we call them simple carbohydrates. But the quick energy that most people associate with simple sugars only lasts for about 20 minutes, and then the energy level drops below where it originally started. That's why you feel a little hyper after eating an entire plastic pumpkin full of Halloween candy, but then a little while later, you feel drained. Okay, so before we move on to something else, let's take a look at carbohydrates one more time. Carbohydrates are the major energy source for your diet. There are two categories for carbohydrates, simple and complex. Simple carbohydrates are sugars. Complex carbohydrates are glycogen, starches, and fibers. The sugars, which are simple carbohydrates, are either monosaccharides or disaccharides. Monosaccharides are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. There are three main monosaccharides, glucose, fructose, and galactose. Disaccharides, the other kind of simple carbohydrate, are just pairs of monosaccharides. Starches and fibers, which are complex carbohydrates, are called polysaccharides and are made up of monosaccharide chains. Section B, fats. Contrary to popular belief, we actually need some fat in our diets to keep us healthy. There are three basic functions food fats perform in our bodies. First, they are a fuel source for energy. Second, they supply essential nutrients to the body. And third, they give our food flavor and texture. First, as a fuel source for energy, food fats supply a basic continuing source of fuel for the body. This allows the body to store and burn fuel as needed for energy. Fats have 9 kilocalories of energy per gram, compared to carbohydrates at 4 kilocalories per gram. This means that when other energy sources are depleted, fat sticks around and continues fueling the body. Not too shabby, huh? Second, food fats also provide essential nutrients to our bodies in the form of fatty acids. Because they're essential, these nutrients are known as essential fatty acids. Two essential fatty acids, linoleic acid and linolenic acid, are needed to supplement the body's internal supply of fat. Our bodies can't make these fatty acids, but we need them. Most vegetable oils and meats supply us with these two essential fatty acids. Third, Fats also satiate or satisfy the body longer than carbohydrates. Fats also provide some of the flavor in foods. In short, fats may not make us feel as full as fiber or other carbohydrates, but they give us a feeling of satisfaction. They satiate us. Mmm, fat. As some of us know oh too well, there are fats in our body tissues. What we may not know are the seven functions tissue fats serve. That's right. Those fatty tissues aren't just there to torture us during swimsuit season. There are seven reasons why tissue fats are good for you. The seven Tech V10 reasons. Why do we call them Tech V10? Because it helps us remember them. Just take a look. First, as you all probably know, our tissues are made up of millions of cells. Each of those cells has a cell membrane. Remember all that from 10th grade biology? Anyway, fat is a constituent of cell membranes. In other words, because fat is an important part of a cell membrane, it contributes to the cell structure and therefore contributes to tissue membrane structure. That's where the first T in Tech V10 comes from, tissue membrane structure. But the fats in these membranes aren't just there to lend support. They also help transport nutrient materials and metabolites, the substance produced through metabolism across those cell membranes. Secondly, energy is fueled by fat in most body tissue except for the nervous system and the brain, which depend on glucose. Third, cell metabolism is conducted by fat.